today. If you would, turn with us in your Bibles to John chapter 13. I was just going to read one verse, verse 35, but I'm going to back up to verse 34. We're going to share two verses. John 13, verse 34, Jesus was speaking. He said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. That's enough gospel to get the whole world saved. If we as God's people could learn to love one another. But people want to question, what's that love look like? How does it operate? Jesus revealed it. He said, as I have loved you. How did Jesus love those disciples? He cared for them. He watched out for them. He took care of them. He traveled with them. He slept where they slept. He ate where they ate. He lived where they lived. He laid down his life for them. Oh, if we could see that kind of love in the body of Christ, I believe we could get the whole world saved and then Jesus could come back and we could get this all over with. Love is what it's going to take. Not doctrine. Not opinions. Not denominations. Not I'm right and you're wrong. But Jesus said, love one another as he loved his disciples. So we're going to look this morning at God's word to figure out what this love looks like. And in trying to figure out what this love looks like, we're going to look at five things love does. Number one, the first thing love does, love removes fear. 1 John 4, 18 John said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, now that's the kind of love Jesus was talking about. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made in perfect love. Do you believe this morning that, oh, fear has to disappear when love shows up? When we truly love one another the way that Jesus loved those disciples, there will be no room in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives for fear to reside. Where perfect love is, fear has to go. Where perfect love is, there is joy. Where perfect love is, there is peace. Where the God kind of love, agape love that he loves us with, if we can learn to extend just a percentage of that kind of perfect perfect love, we can live in a world free from fear. He said it casts it out. I want you to know that means it removes it. That's like when you get a stain on your shirt and you pull your tide stick out. That stain is fear and that tide stick is perfect love. All you've got to do is rub that tide stick on that stain and that stain disappears. It is removed. It is gone. It's not going to come back five minutes from now. No, once it's removed, it's removed. And once we get love on the inside of us that flows to the outside of us, that reaches those round about us, fear has to go. The world is living in fear. The world is groping in fear. People are fearful about tomorrow. What's going to happen? I don't have the answers. I'm going to stand and be honest with you. I made my mind up a long time ago. It's better just to be honest with people. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what tomorrow holds. But like Bill Gaither said, I know who holds tomorrow. And if we've got a hold of that hand that we learned perfect love from, we don't have to walk in fear. Oh, we don't have to walk in fear of what tomorrow holds or next week holds or next year holds or what eternity holds. We know whose we are. And church, God extends that perfect love to us. And I'll tell you what, I'm a giver. I, I honestly, my wife will tell you this, I get more joy out of giving things away than I do receiving things. Now, it's Christmas coming, and I like gifts. I'm not saying don't buy me anything. I'm just saying that I get a lot more joy out of giving things away. Amen. And you know what? When God put that love in my heart, Lisa, when that perfect love came to live on the inside of me, it changed me from the evil, vile, wicked person I used to be. Yes. And instead of looking at people yes. like they were nothing right. or nobody, right. I began looking at people as God sees them. 
And instead of trying to figure out what I might be able to get from somebody, Brother Joe, I began trying to figure out what I could give them to help their life get better. That perfect love that I received caused all the fear that I had within me to be removed and I started extending that perfect love. That's the mission of this ministry. We want to love those who seem unlovable. Some people are hard to love. Some people it'd be more fun to choke them than it would love them. You got some of those people, don't you? That's why you're laughing. Some of them are related to us. Some of them are sitting next to you. Maybe. <laughs> but you know what? When that perfect love comes on the inside of us and fear is removed, it causes us to become lovers of people. When we start loving people, we start changing lives. And when lives begin to change, God comes on the scene and he gets the glory and families are changed. And when families are changed, churches are changed. And when churches are changed, communities are changed. And when communities are changed, cities are changed. And when cities are changed, states are changed. And if we can get the states to change, we can get this nation to turn back to this person perfect love and then perhaps we can see a change in the world Amen. but you. we've got to start by that perfect love and when we start with that perfect love it will remove fear number two the second thing love does love overlooks people's faults Amen. oh I'm thankful for that because unlike all of you awesome Christians I've got a lot of faults I've got a lot of faults get your pen out honey she could write down some and share them with you. Proverbs 10, verse 12 says, Hatred stirs up strifes, but love covers all sins. I like the way it reads in the easy to read version. It says, Hatred causes arguments, but love overlooks all wrongs. What does that mean? When we walk in that perfect love, we learn to be forgivers. We learn to overlook people's faults. We don't operate the way we did before we were saved and say that person annoys me and I can't be around them. When perfect love comes to live in our heart, we are able to cover sins. We are able to overlook faults. We are able to live peaceably with all people because of the love within us. Well, I just can't stand her or I just can't stand him. There are some people you're going to have to love from a distance. That's just the truth. Some people do not want to be gotten along with. I can get along with anybody, but if somebody is cantankerous and mean and vulgar and evil, I don't have to spend my time around them. I can love them from way over here. I can throw a biscuit 50 yards. If they're hungry, I can get them fed, but I don't have to get close to them to feed them. <laughs> that perfect love, once it gets on the inside of us, causes us to see people differently. Amen. The people that used to irritate us might not irritate us quite as much because the love of Christ has now been manifest right. in our lives. Right. You say, well, that's hard. That's impossible. Jesus did it. Amen. Peter betrayed him. Yes. Yet when Jesus came out of the tomb, yes. he instructed those that came yes. to go tell the disciples and Peter. He was signifying, Peter, I'm going to overlook your faults. Peter, I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to cover those for you. You say, well, that was Jesus and Peter. Well, I got news for you. Jesus did it for you too. Amen. Jesus did it for me too. I miss it every day. I get wrong attitudes. You say, I can't believe he'd admit that. I, I had one this morning. Praise God. I need to repent to my wife and love her up and kiss her right here in front of the whole church. Sundays are the most stressful day of our life. Do you know why? Because we're coming in here to minister under the anointing. She's going to teach and I'm going to preach and the devil does all he can to tear us up on Sunday morning. I almost missed breakfast. You would have been in trouble then. It wouldn't have been her fault. I went up and woke all the boys up this morning and told them, come on, we got 45 minutes. We all got to load up and get there. Then the girls are coming later and bringing the babies. 40 minutes later, I went upstairs and Josh was still in there snoring. 
I walked in and said, what are you doing? I'm asleep. I said, I told you we're leaving in 45 minutes. I, I, I stayed up late. I said, what time did you go to bed? Three o'clock. I said, why would you go to bed at 3 o'clock? That's what time I normally get off of work. I said, I'm done with this. I'm done. You're an adult now. You're almost 19 years old. You're a bad example for the rest of the kids in this family. I'm done. I'll take you to your mother's house. When I get back from church, and I left and went and got in the truck, and we went to Walmart, bought everything for breakfast, and got about halfway through town, I told Vanessa, take me back to the house. She took me back to the house, and there he sat on the edge of the couch. <laughs> I said, what do you want? And he answered so profoundly, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I'm done. That's it. And I left again. I went down and got in his truck. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And said, I go through this every day with my people. I said, why do you put up with it, Lord? He said, you're one of them. I went back up and had a 40-minute talk. Josh apologized. Josh asked for another chance. And because of God's perfect love in my heart, I extended forgiveness and I overlooked those faults. When we have perfect love, we'll do that not only for our children, not only for our spouses, but for our neighbors and for our friends and for our church family. There have been churches split because of disagreements, because people are so stubborn and so bullheaded and refuse to walk in perfect love, they'll split and go their separate ways and never talk again. When Jesus said, love one another like I loved you. When we do that, we overlook faults. We overlook faults. And I know I've got three of them. Moving on, number three, the third thing love does. Love builds churches. Amen. You say, no, people build churches. Jesus builds churches. Contractors build churches. No, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, Paul said to the church at Corinth, now listen to this. He said, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We read that and don't even understand what it's saying. Let me break it down for you. Let me read it to you in the Living Bible. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Paul said, Next is your question about eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. On this question, everyone feels that only his answer is the right one. But although being a know-it-all makes us feel important, what really is needed to build the church is love. What is really needed to build the church is love is love. What is really needed to build the church is love. What is really needed to build the church is love. Not the pastor's preaching, not the singing, not the music, not the teaching, not the Sunday school program, not the dinners, not the breakfast. It is love that builds the church. The love that Christ had for his disciples when we share it with other human beings, it will build the church. Right, amen. Jesus looked at Peter and said, upon this rock, upon the truth of what you just said, that I'm Jesus, the son of the living God, upon this truth, I'm going to build my church. Amen. And you know what? That church hadn't diminished. That church is still growing. They were adding 3,000 people a day to that church. I'm looking for it to happen right here in West Tulsa. Amen. I told Josh this morning, I said, the BOK Center may have to just shut down and let us use it for a sanctuary because we are going to love people to the extent where they're going to know it's the love of God and they're going to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west into this place to be part of that love. Amen. The perfect church can be built with love. Amen. Edified, built up. I'm looking to build a perfect church full of imperfect people like me and the only thing perfect about it will be the love of Christ that flows from it that makes us reach out to each other. Whether we're white or black, whether we're Chinese or Mexican, whether we're Japanese or Jewish, doesn't matter who we are, where we come from. 
no matter how rich we are, how poor we are, no matter if we drove a new Cadillac here today or rode on a horse, does not matter. We are all in this together and we all need to love one another and we can all build the perfect church through love. Love builds the church. What does a perfect church look like? It depends on who you talk to. You get 10 different preachers and they'll tell you their plans to build their church and they're all uh, founded on different things many times. They all look different. I heard a story about a pastor who was wanting to build a church. They'd outgrown their church, and he was saying, I want to build the perfect church. And one of the members came to him. He was a millionaire. He said, Pastor, I'm going to send you and your wife to the Holy Land for three months. While you're gone, I'm going to build this perfect church. I'm hiring contractors. When you get back, you're going to love it. So the pastor and his wife went off to the Holy Land, gone three months, come back, and that man had constructed the most beautiful cathedral you've ever seen. He said, Pastor, I want to show you. It is technologically advanced. This church has everything you would ever want. They walked in the sanctuary. It was huge and vast. The platform was high and beautiful. And there was one pew in the whole sanctuary on the very back wall. The pastor said, what in the world were you thinking? He said, just watch. Just watch. He said, wait till service starts. It got close to service time. People began to come in. They looked around, sat on that pew. When the pew filled up, a bell rang. Levers began to move, mechanisms came into place, and that pew slid down to the front of the sanctuary, clank, lock shut, and in the back another pew popped up. Boop. The pastor said, wonderful, marvelous, this is the perfect church. And as people come in, the pews kept moving until the sanctuary is full. The pastor got up to preach his message. He got behind the pulpit. He preached five minutes. He preached 10 minutes. He preached 20 minutes. He preached till noon. At five minutes after noon, a bell rang. Levers clanked. The pulpit floor opened and the pastor fell through and disappeared. And the church said, wonderful, marvelous. This is the perfect church. It just depends on who you are. It depends on what you're looking for. What I'm looking for in a perfect church is that we operate in the love of God, the love of Christ. That's what it's about. It's not about my opinion. It's not about what color the carpet is. I'm telling you what, churches have split over the carpet over whether they have pews or chairs, which side the piano's on. Hey, we've been ding-dongs long enough. Let's straighten up and grow up and start operating in the love of Christ and reach the world. Let's build the church through love. That's the only way we're going to do it. Number four, the fourth thing love does. Love grows. You see that blonde over there? Raise your hand. Not you, Phyllis, the one in the front. Isn't she beautiful? The first time I saw her, she was 17 years old. I shouldn't tell this because a bunch of boys in this church will get ideas about my girls, but she was 17 and I was 23. And I fell in love with her. I walked up to her, I said, where have you been? She looked at me like, you are a dork. Get away from me. And you know what? We dated for a short time that summer, and we were going to get married, but she was a Jehovah's Witness, and I was a holiness boy, and it, it, it didn't work out. We went separate ways, had separate lives. Married, had children. Both found ourselves single 20-some years later. I ran into her at a bank. And when she turned around and saw me, that love was still there. And through a friendship that we rekindled that year, that love grew. True love, the God kind of love, doesn't start on one level and stay there. It grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. You might think you love this church right now. You're going to love it more in six months because God's love is manifest in this place and it grows. It does not remain stagnant. It doesn't get stagnant by remaining on the same level. It has to grow. You say, what are you talking about? Jude 1 verse 2. The word says, mercy unto you and peace and love multiplied. We know what multiplication is. Look at our Christmas picture. Amen. Jude 1 verse 2 in the easy to read version says, Mercy, peace, and love be yours more and more. 
That got to me when I read that, Brother Joe. More and more. You know what? We ought to be loving God more and more every day. We ought to be loving our family more and more every day. We ought to be loving our church more and more every day. We ought to be loving these kids that are being brought in more and more every day. Everything that we do in love should increase and multiply every day like a story I heard about a couple that's had their 50th wedding anniversary. The wife looked at her husband and said, you haven't told me you love me in 50 years. That's bad, ain't it? I'll, I'll do the jokes. <laughs> he looked at her and said, I told you I loved you on the day we got married. And if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> let us not love like that. Let us tell one another. I like it when people say, I love you, Pastor. And I tell people I love you every day. When I hug these kids, I love you. Every day I tell my wife, how many times a day do I tell you I love you? Lots and lots. You know what? I like to kiss her. And the more I tell her I love her, the more I get to kiss her. And the more I get to hug her. Amen. And that's what love is all about, praise God. We have peace and joy in our house because of the love we have between each other. And that love grows. I didn't know I could love her anymore. And you know what? We're, we're getting up there in years and we're going to get even older. But regardless of what happens, our love is going to continue to grow. And when we love each other with that love that Christ spoke about, it can't help but grow. It doesn't wane. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't back up. It keeps growing and growing and growing. And I am thankful today to know what the love of Christ is all about. And I love each and every one of you with the love of Christ. Number five, the fifth thing that love does, love shows the world that we are God's people. We're going to go right back to where we started, John 13, 35. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. That seems easy, doesn't it? But let me tell you what I was taught for years. By well-meaning, good Christian people. Let me tell you what I was taught. The world will know we're his by the way we wear our hair. Huh? Huh? Ladies, the world will know you're his if you, if, you, if you wear a skirt and not britches. Tara's got her bun in. We started calling that the spirit of bondage years later. <laughs> we were taught that the world would know we were God's people if we came in line with a certain set of rules and regulations. And I'm not picking on anybody because there's a lot of sincere people who still adhere to that. If you're a lady and you think you have to get your hair this big to be pleasing to God, then by all means do it. Just make sure your tongue isn't as big as your hair. Because you've heard me say it before, it doesn't matter if your hair is this high, if your tongue's that long, you're still going to hell, praise God. <laughs> Let us not try to show the world that we're God's people by how much scripture we can quote. Some people think if they can quote a whole chapter or a whole book that that's really going to impress somebody and let them know that they belong to God. The devil did that to Jesus when he was in the wilderness, quoting scripture to him. The devil knows that book. The devil knows that Bible. Knowing the scripture doesn't prove to the world you are God's. The only way this lost world is going to know that we are God's people is if we have love one to another. And not just one to another, but to those outside our group. Amen. To those outside our belief system. Now, I'll get some nasty email on this, but I'll tell you what, I want to reach this entire city for Christ. I don't care if they're Jewish, if they're Muslim, I don't care where they come from or where they've been. We're starting a program. I'm going to get this out there right now. I've been looking at getting another website going. I'm trying to buy the domain name. I want to start a ministry within this ministry called Feed the Family. We've had feed the children. I want to feed the family. What does that mean? We don't want any families in this community, in this city, in this state going hungry. 
Who is the family? Well, just us, those who believe like we believe. That's our family. There are people who actually think that way. Well, if they're not part of us, then they're not for us, and we're not going to worry about them. We're just going to take care of our own. That is a satanic mentality that excludes too many people. We're going to feed the family. And if people come up here and they need food and they don't even believe in God, we're going to tell them how much we love them, how much God loves them, give them food, send them back home. That kind of love shows the world that we are God's people. Getting out of our comfort zone. Visiting with people that you wouldn't normally visit with. Sitting at dinner with someone you wouldn't normally sit with. Doing the work of God the way he commanded us to do it demands that we do it through the love that Christ had for his disciples. We are going to feed the family, and that includes every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this city, regardless of race, religion, or creed. We are family! Now let me say this. We want them all to get saved. We still believe at this church that Christ is the only way to the Father. It takes a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll say that to the church and everyone watching by television. I'm not saying anything goes. Just come in and do whatever you want to. No, I'm saying get in here and allow the love of Christ to change your life. When we operate in that kind of love, the world will know that we are His. Amen? All right, would you bow your heads with us real quick? Father, we come to you this